do I tell you about my conversion to Christ without making it sound, well, like an alien abduction? (laughs) Nothing about it made practical sense. I spent my young adult life in serially monogamous lesbian relationships and working to advance LGBT rights. And this was back in the day when atheists called themselves atheists and didn't falsify the gospel. The world we live in now with constitutional rights to gay marriage and abortion is the world that I helped create. Although I lived as a lesbian, I never hated men. In my 20s, I even dated men. But as I was publicly dating men, I was privately falling in love with women. At 28, I met my first lesbian lover, and life finally came together for me and made sense. My life as a lesbian seemed normal. I considered it an enlightened, chosen path. Lesbianism felt cleaner and more moral to me. Always preferring symmetry to asymmetry, I believed I had found my real self. And the name Jesus, which had rolled off my tongue in a little girl's prayer and then rolled off my back in college, soon made me recoil in anger. At this time, I was a professor of English and women's studies at Syracuse University. Oh, how I tired of students who believed that knowing Jesus meant knowing little else. Christians seemed like bad readers to me. Ironic, I thought, given that you all believed that the Bible was the true truth. Christians used the Bible in a way that Marxists call vulgar, to end a conversation rather than to deepen it. But the most frustrating thing to me about Christians is that they simply would not leave consenting adults alone. I cared about morality, justice, and compassion. As a 19th century scholar, fervent for the worldviews of Freud, Hegel, Marx, and Darwin. I strove to stand with the disempowered. And my life was happy, meaningful, and full. My lesbian partner and I shared many vital interests. AIDS activism, children's health and literacy, our golden retriever rescue, our Unitarian Universalist church, just to name a few. It was hard to argue that she and I were anything but good citizens and caregivers. The LGBTQ community values hospitality and applies it with skill, sacrifice, and integrity. And indeed, I honed the hospitality gifts that I use today as a pastor's wife in my lesbian community. After my tenure book was written, I began writing my next one on the religious right and their politics of hatred against people like me. I considered you all members of an evangelical Christian college community to be chief hate mongers that comprised this assault against me. You people terrified me and truth be told, you sometimes still do. 20 years ago, I faced my fear of you by writing a book against you. And to write this book, I began reading the Bible. I took note that the Bible was an engaging literary display of every genre, trope, and type. It had edgy poetry, deep and complex philosophy, and compelling narrative stories. It also embodied a worldview that I hated. Sin, repentance, Sodom and Gomorrah? I thought that was totally absurd. At this time, the old Christian men's movement, the Promise Keepers, came to town, 
and they parked their little circus at the university. I was on a war against patriarchy, so I wrote an article and published it in the local newspaper. The article was titled, Promise Keeper's Message is a Danger to Democracy. The article generated many rejoinders, so many that I kept boxes on both sides of my desk, one for hate mail and one for fan mail. One letter I received, though, completely defied my filing system. It was from Ken Smith, then the pastor of the Syracuse Reformed Presbyterian Church. It was, and still is to this day, the kindest letter of opposition I have ever received. And this puzzled me. You see, I was suspicious of both the motives and the worldview that Christians espoused. I had seen my share of Bible verses and placards at gay pride marches. That Christians who protested against me and mocked me at gay pride day were happy that I and everyone I loved was going to hell was about as clear as the sky is blue. But Ken's letter did not mock. It engaged. And from his letter, Ken seemed different from those other folks. So when he invited me to dinner at his house to discuss these things more fully, I accepted, and my motives at the time were clear. Well, surely this would be good for my research. I sort of considered Ken Smith my unpaid research assistant for this book. Well, something else happened. Ken and his wife Floy and I became friends. They entered my world they met my friends. We did book exchanges. We talked openly about sexuality and politics, and they didn't act as if such conversations were actually polluting them. They did not treat me like a blank slate. When we ate together, which we did at least weekly at the Smith House for at least two years before I ever stepped foot into his church, Ken prayed in a way that I had simply never heard before. His prayers were intimate and vulnerable. He repented of his sin in front of me. He thanked God for all things, and Ken's God was holy and firm, yet full of mercy. And at the first meal at their home, Ken and Floyd omitted two very important steps in the rule book of how Christians are supposed to deal with a heathen like me. You know, everybody knows the rule book, folks. You may have written it, but we all read it. And this is what he didn't do. Number one, he did not share the gospel with me. And number two, he did not invite me to church. I mean, what was I, chopped liver? You know, everybody gets treated like that, right? But because of these omissions to the Christian rule book, as I had come to learn it, I knew that when Ken extended his hand to me in friendship, it was safe for me to close my hand in his. You see, I was not Ken's project. I was Ken's neighbor. This was not friendship evangelism. This was friendship. I started meeting with Ken and Floyd regularly, reading the Bible in earnest with pen in hand and notebook in lap. I read the Bible the way I was trained to read a book. So I was not raised to be an evangelical. I didn't know you're supposed to read it one verse at a time like your horoscope. Nobody ever got me that memo. So I just read it, you know, like the heathen that I was, reading a book. Usually, I would sit down and read whole books at once. And I would fight with its textual authority, its authorship, its canonicity, and its internal hermeneutics. But slowly and over time, and after much Bible reading, I ended up reading the Bible seven times through before I set foot in a church. The Bible started to take on a life and a meaning that really startled me. Some of my well-worn paradigms no longer stuck. And I had to at least ponder the hermeneutical claim that this book was different from all the others because it was inspired by a holy God and inherently true 
and trustworthy. But I fundamentally rejected what I believed was the false simplicity of Christian logic, and that's its doctrine of sin and its hermeneutical belief that the Bible was God-breathed, that is, revealed, not created, and fully true and trustworthy. Christians believe that because Jesus paid with his life for the sin of all those who repent and believe in him, we have Christ's power to flee even from unchosen sin, which the Bible records as treason against God and punishable by death and hell. I noticed as I read the Bible that its admonitions about sin were followed by offers of grace and that the God of the Bible deals differently with people who dealt differently with him. But that whole Jesus saves you from your sin shtick was deeply offensive to me. How could that system actually work for me? I didn't think my lesbianism was hurting anyone. I believed I was being my authentic self. And I recoiled at the idea that being a lesbian was living in sin. I mean, really, who in her right mind would choose a God you cannot see over a lover you can? It seemed to me that the gospel was both illogical and very bad news for people like me, people who called ourselves gay. But if God is the creator of all things and if this Bible has his seal of truth and power, then it did seem to me logical that the Bible had the right to interrogate my life and my culture and not the other way around. You see, even as a postmodern reader and a postmodern professor, I understood the idea that authority can only depend upon that which is higher than itself. I mean, after all, I was a professor, and if your paper was due to me today, and instead you gave it to me on Friday, it just would not go very well for you. I mean, you may be a very nice person, much nicer than I am, but I still have more authority than you. And so I wondered, who is higher than God? Well, my friends knew that I was reading the Bible for my research, and that it was becoming somewhat more of a research project for me. At a dinner gathering that my partner and I were hosting, my transgender friend Jill cornered me in the kitchen. She put her large hand over mine, and she said, Rosaria, that Bible reading is changing you, and I'm scared. Well, I felt exposed. She was right, she always was. She was one of my wisest friends. And so I said, Jill, what if it's true? What if Jesus is a real and risen Lord? What if we are all in trouble, I asked. Jill exhaled deeply, sat down in the chair across from mine. Her eyes looked wise, and she said this, Rosaria, I was a Presbyterian minister for 15 years. I prayed that God would heal me, but he didn't. If you want, I will pray for you. Okay, so now you know what gay rights activists actually talk about in the kitchen. Well, this encounter gave me a kind of secret, tacit permission to keep reading the Bible. I mean, my dear friend Jill had also read it cover to cover many times and had rooted around in its deep crevices for life purpose and help. But the bomb she dropped also enraged me. I didn't need healing. I believed that gay is good and valuable and ethical. And even the Bible I read didn't say I needed healing. It said I needed to repent of my sins. So quite frankly, I just, I just rejected both ideas and went on with my life. But the next day, when I returned home from work, I found two large milk crates spilling over with theological books, Jill's books, from seminary. She was giving them to me. And in Calvin's Institutes, in Jill's handwriting, was a warning. Watch Romans 1. And I'm going to read Romans 1. 21 to 27, so if you have your Bibles, you can open them with me. (laughs) 
you know, truthfully, I had read the Bible many times through at this point, but there are some passage, passages I just kept skipping, you know, kind of blurring past, this was one of them, but with my friend's marginalia, I couldn't help but to actually face it. All right. Romans 1, verses 17, 20, no, verses 21 to 27. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. And therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever, amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Well, these verses seem to provide a haunting literary echo to Genesis 3, where Eve's desire to live independently of God's authority made perfect sense to me. The two literary frames, one in Genesis and one in Romans, stood out as the table of contents of what ails the world. In fact, Romans 1 does not end by highlighting homosexuality as a morally neutral form of quote unquote sexual orientation, a discrete and separate category of inherited personhood that many people believe it to be today. No, not at all. Instead, this passage finds its crescendo in how one sin, homosexuality, morphs into other sins. Read with me now verses 29 to 32. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die. They not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. That last line grabbed me by the throat, give approval to those who practice them. It told me that people who cannot receive a blessing from God will demand it from man. As the faculty advisor to many LGBTQ groups on campus, this really got my attention. But I also took note of the theological diagnosis. Homosexuality in the Bible is presented here as one step in the journey away from God's blessing and protection. The Bible condemns homosexuality as a verb, what some people do, and does not recognize it as a noun, supposedly who some people are. The world has accepted that the 19th century invention of sexual orientation as an accurate category of personhood is true. But that's not how the Bible understands homosexuality. Homosexuality from God's point of view is an identity rooted ethical outworking of this original sin. Therefore, it seemed solidly biblical to say that indeed, some of us are born this way. Because truth be told, we are all born in Adam, born this way, distorted by original sin, in one way or another. But by failing to rigorously relinquish my identity to God's story, and failing to understand that the fall rendered even my deepest, most primal feelings as untrustworthy and un true, I had added to my ledger of original sin 
by creating for myself a category of personhood that God did not. God has one category of personhood. We are male and female image bearers of a holy God with a soul that will last forever and a gendered body that according to the Christian worldview will either inhabit the new Jerusalem or suffer in eternity in hell. Well, there is simply no biblical category of personhood subsumed under the 19th century category invention of sexual orientation. Instead, the Bible declares that we are made in the image of God and have a sin orientation in Adam and a soul orientation in eternity. And once born again in Christ, a new citizenship, one that came in exchange for the life you loved, not in addition to it. In spite of believing, living, and teaching the idea that sexuality and gender were social constructs, the Bible made it clear to me that God has set ethical and moral responsibilities, blessings, and constraints for being born male and female. I had taught, studied, read, and lived a very different notion of sexuality. And for the first time in my life, I wondered if I was wrong. Well, that's when this research project came to a halt. And I tried to toss the Bible and its teachings in the trash. I really tried. But Ken Smith was my friend by this point. And only because he encouraged me to keep reading did I do that. Among other things, I was fighting with the idea that the Bible is inspired and inerrant. That is, that the biblical authors were moved by the Holy Spirit to record the, the revealed word of God, not the constructed word of God. And that the Bible is completely true and without error. Well, how in the world could a smart cookie like me actually embrace such things? I was a postmodernist. I did not believe in truth. I believed in truth claims. I believed that the reader constructed the text, that a text's meaning only found its power in the reader's interpretation of it. Without a reader, I told my students over and over again, a book is just paper and glue. How dare this one book lay claim to a birthright, and a progeny totally different from every other book in the world. Well, after years and years of this, something happened. The word of God revealed to me two things. Number one, who God is. And number two, who I am. I have never been the same after this revelation. The Bible got to be bigger inside me than I. It overflowed into my world and I fought against it with all my might. And then one Sunday morning, two years after I first met Ken and Floyd and two years after I started reading the Bible for my research, I left the bed I shared with my lesbian lover and an hour later, I sat in a pew at the Syracuse Reformed Presbyterian Church. Oh boy, did I feel like a freak sitting there. I kept thinking about last year's gay pride march, wide as it was with people just like me, people who made me feel safe and loved, people I valued as family. When I crossed the threshold of the church's door, I became a traitor and a turncoat to the people I loved most in the world. But I kept going back to church to hear more sermons. I had made friendships with people in the church by this time, and I was really perplexed by how they referenced the Bible in the details of their days. Well, you should know this, you probably do. English professors by training love textual cross-referencing. And if you can throw in some direct quotations from ancient texts, that's all the better. But I muddled this over in my mind. Cross-referencing the Bible with your life places you inside God's story, inside God's ontology. Is that safe? Is that 
deadly? Well, I sure knew it would have been deadly for me. You wouldn't see me trying that crazy stuff. But I was noticing something else about my Christian friends. They were actually getting things out of the Bible that I wasn't. Well, I was a smart cookie. I was trained to be a reader. I couldn't figure out why they were getting things I was missing. They were understanding how this Bible fit together as a whole. Why couldn't I see what they did? Well, during this time, Ken Smith was preaching through the Gospel of Matthew, a very literary gospel with its bewildering cast of characters and problems, unsuspecting folks folks separated unto the gospel, seeds choked by the world, feeding thousands with some poor and nameless kids bread and fish. I always felt sorry for that poor guy. We don't even know his name. (laughs) And then Jesus' question, his cutting question, to impetuous Peter, do you still lack understanding? Well, one Lord's Day, Pastor Ken just stopped right there, turned his steel blue eyes on the congregation, held us in a long pause, a really long pause. I mean, so long a pause, I just kind of wondered, what do the frozen chosen do when the old man behind the pulpit has a heart attack? (laughs) You know, what do we do? Sit quietly, politely. Well, finally he spoke, you know, praise God, and he said, do you still lack understanding? Congregation, hasn't Christ ever said this to you? Well, that really startled me because this was my question. This question was for me. Why couldn't I see what they did? Do I still lack understanding? And for a split second, before I could just shove this down faster than I was receiving it, I thought of one horrifying thought. Who is speaking here? That old man I thought he was about to have a heart attack? Or the God man behind the creation of the world and the redemption of his people? And I couldn't stop it, but the image that crashed like waves in a raging sea of me and everyone I loved suffering in hell, vomited into my consciousness and gripped me in its teeth. And not because we called ourselves gay. I couldn't go there yet. Too close, too personal. But because we were proud, we wanted to be autonomous. We rejected the Bible's interpretive authority over our sexuality, our sexual identity, and our sexual practice. If the Bible is true, I was dead. And if the Bible is false, or only semi-true, or only true in red letters, or only true when it resonates with my favorite literary-trained hermeneutical preference, then you are listening to the biggest fool on earth. But God's promises rolled in like another round of waves into my world. And one Lord's Day, Ken was preaching on John 7, 17. If anyone wills to do God's will, he shall know concerning the doctrine. Well, this verse exposed the quicksand in which my feet were stuck. I was a thinker. I was paid to read books and write about them and tell you people what to think about them. And I expected that in all areas of my life, understanding came before obedience, not the other way around. I wanted God to show me on my terms why homosexuality was a sin and why my favorite reading practices were idolatrous. I wanted to be the judge, not the one being judged. Perhaps I thought like Eve in the garden, I wanted to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil so that I could become and replace God. And then I wondered, hadn't I already done this? Oh, hadn't we all? If my consciousness fell in Adam's sin, as the Bible purports, no wonder I couldn't think my way out of this quandary. This wasn't a game of thinking and the matching of wits. Could my heart echo God's call for obedience? That's what was being asked. Could I will to do God's will just this once? The stakes were so very high because they always are. But this verse promised, it promised understanding after obedience. And I wrestled with the question, did I really want to understand homosexuality from God's point of view? Or did I just want to argue with him? I prayed that night. 
I actually prayed that God would give me the willingness to obey before I understood. I prayed that God would be pleased to reveal his son in me. I prayed that I would be a vessel of Jesus. And then I moved to gender, and I don't know why, but I had a growing desire to make biblical sense of my place in the world as a woman defined by and covered by God. And so I prayed that God would make me a godly woman, and then I laughed out loud in unbelief at the insanity of that one. (laughs) I left that night of prayer with one question. Could original sin be for real? And could it really distort me like this? I mean, is my sexual love for women a reflection of the real me or a distortion of it through original sin? Who am I, I wondered. Well, I felt like a lesbian in my body and heart. But if Jesus could split the world asunder, divide the soul and the spirit, judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart, could he make my true identity prevail? Who will God have me to be? Oh, I felt my flesh's identity profoundly. But what is a Christian identity? The Bible makes clear that fallen flesh and a redeemed mind have a troubled relationship this side of eternity. For many people in the Bible, their redeemed identity and calling comes only after a long struggle with God, with wilderness, with dreams and hopes and plans dashed and destroyed. What will become of me if Jesus takes over? The cross is ruthless and it makes no ally with the sin it crushes in the death and resurrection of the Lord. And what if I commit my life to Christ and my lesbian feelings never disappear? What does that mean? Does that mean that God does not love me or hear me or care? Is the gospel good news or bad news for people who call themselves gay. Who is this Jesus? Did I know him? Did I still lack understanding? Could I trust him? And then one ordinary day, I came to Jesus. I mean, you know there are no altar calls in my kind of church, so the man whose back of the head I stared at, who got a haircut every six weeks, you know, had no idea that the angels were dancing in heaven at this particular moment. Uh, We were singing from Psalm 119, line 56. This has become mine. And when those words came out of my mouth, I choked. Well, I had just sung condemnation unto myself, and I was actually in tune enough with the Holy Spirit to feel his convicting rebuke. This Bible was not mine. Oh, I had read it many, many times, seven to be exact, but I'd also scurned it and cursed it and despised it and taught thousands of college students to do the same. But I saw for myself that it had a holy author. I saw for myself that it was a, can- it was a canonized collection of 66 books with a unified biblical revelation. And I heard from myself that when the phrase, this has become mine, came out of my mouth in congregational singing, I was actually attesting to this one simple truth. The line of communication that God ordained for his people required this wrestling with scripture, and that I truly wanted to both hear God's word breathed into my life, and I wanted God to hear my prayers. The fog burned away. The whole Bible, each jot and each tittle, was my open highway to a holy God. My hands let go of the wheel of self-invention. I came to Jesus alone, open-handed, and naked. I had no dignity upon which to stand. As an advocate for peace and social justice, I thought I was on the side of kindness, integrity, care, diversity, compassion. It was thus a crushing revelation to discover it. It was Jesus I had been persecuting the whole time. Not some historical figure named Jesus, not some imaginary friend named Jesus, but My Jesus, my prophet, my priest, my king, my husband, 
my friend, my savior, that Jesus. There is only one thing to do when you meet the living God. You must fall on your face and repent of your sins. I started by repenting of my pride, the pride that led me to believe that I could invent my own rules for faith and life and sexual autonomy. The pride that said that I was entitled to live separately from God. The pride that led me to believe that self-worth was self-made. Repentance is the daily posture of the Christian. Repentance is the threshold to a holy God. It is the only no shame solution to a renewed Christian life because it proves only the obvious that God was right all along. Conversion did not immediately change my sexual desires for women. You see, I was never converted out of homosexuality. I was converted out of unbelief. And you know what, folks? If that's good enough for God, that better be good enough for you. The gospel comes in exchange for the life you love, not in addition to it. Gospel life is cross-bearing life. And homosexual desires for many believers is a cross to bear. I choose my words carefully, friends. There is a world view of difference between struggling against homosexual desires and claiming the false identity of the gay Christian. The former is noble Christian work. The latter is heresy. If you are listening today and you are experiencing unchosen homosexual desires and you are battling this sin God's way, forsaking the false identity of the alphabet soup of LGBTQ for the true identity of image bearer of a holy God, forsaking through grace any sexual expression that God calls sin, embracing chastity in singleness and fidelity in marriage, and what my friend and author Christopher Yuan calls holy sexuality, then you, agonizing struggle and all, you are a hero of the faith. As you stand in the risen Christ alone in this battle, you should not be shunned or despised or demeaned, but rather embraced as a decorated soldier standing in robes of righteousness, hearing your father's words, beloved son, beloved daughter, in you I am well pleased. For me, something else happened after I crossed the threshold into faith in Christ. My prayer to be a godly woman morphed into another desire, to be a godly wife. Oh, let me say this loud and clear, biblical marriage is not a gospel requirement. I believe that there is a vital and powerful role for singles in the church, and that singleness in Christ is neither selfishness nor secondhand gospel citizenship. Nonetheless, I felt, I felt called, if God willed, to ask God to make me a godly wife to work in me such that I could be a helper in all aspects to one godly man. Years later, after one failed engagement, I met my husband, Kent Butterfield, and we have been joyfully married for 17 years, walking with the Lord together. And my role as Kent's helper and the mother of our children is my daily witness that we serve a God who lives hears our prayers, loves his people, and carries the heavier part of the cross we bear on this earth, liberating captives and equipping us to live fully in Christ as the strongholds of sin are broken down through the grace of Christ's blood. The gospel is always costly. It cost Jesus everything. Jesus took the condemnation and gave me justification. Jesus took the agony and gave me victory. Jesus took the beatings and the stripes and gave me healing. Jesus took the shame and the curse and gave me blessing. The Christian life is not democratic. Some get 10 crosses to bear and others get one. 
And each cross is tailor-made to prepare us for our eternity, where we will judge the angels and stand in robes of righteousness. Not one tear of yours will be wasted. Not one hardship will be for naught. As my friend Sam Alberry puts it, and has said to me on more than one occasion, the gospel is costly, and the gospel is worth it. And all praise and glory go to God. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen.